Jesus washed his disciples' feet. In today's passage, we're going to see what the true meaning of lordship and leadership is as Jesus tied a towel around his waist and washed the feet of his disciples. We're going to examine the God of the towel. Welcome to Crosswords. This is a podcast about practical Christianity. Emphasis on practical. How to put Jesus' words into practice. What does it look like to walk in Jesus' footsteps? As Christians, we live in a culture hostile to righteousness, self-control, and God's judgment. Righteousness because we don't get good messages about what good moral values ought to be. Hostile against self-control because we all make excuses for our behavior as opposed to saying no to sin. And hostile to God's judgment to come because we're usually afraid to talk about death, hell, and judgment. Something Jesus spoke of frequently. So in this podcast, we're going to get your mind and your heart in line with Jesus' words and way. Because He is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the only one who can get us out of this world alive. All scriptures quoted will be from the New International Version. You can follow me on Twitter at Kingdom underscore Saint. Walk with the Lord and be a blessing. In John 13, verses 3 and 4, we read, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. This is a picture of real power. True power is expressed in meekness. If you have to threaten somebody, (laughs) you really don't have power. The really powerful show it by serving. The definition of meekness is power under control. Those who have real power, they choose to empower others. In Revelation, Jesus is presented as a slaughtered lamb. To give you some background on this passage in Revelation 5, 5 through 6, after John was in God's throne room and saw the awesome and marvelous throne room of God and all that was around it, and was assured that God is in control. God reigns. God is seated on his throne, and he had a scroll with seven seals. And no one was found that was worthy to open the scroll to reveal God's will. And so John started to weep because nobody was found that was worthy. And here we pick up in Revelation 5, 5 and 6, where it says, One of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. So we get a picture here of what power really is. At first, John is told, hey, the lion of the tribe of Judah, and you have a lion in your imagination. Wow, that's a powerful picture. Lions are powerful. Who would stand in front of a lion? Who could defeat a lion with his bare hands? But yet, when John looks, he doesn't see a lion at the center of the throne, he sees a lamb, and not just a lamb, a lamb that had been slain. And that is a picture of power. That's what real power looks like here in this world anyway. It is a picture of vulnerability, because that is the way to triumph. Jesus taught us that in this world, it's not appearing as seemingly powerful or big 
or smart that's going to help you triumph? No, that's what the world thinks. That's what the spiritual forces of evil want you to believe. No, Jesus says what is going to help you overcome is to adopt that attitude of vulnerability. Jesus overcame not as a lion of Judah, but as a slaughtered lamb. And so Jesus sets the pace for us to live our lives in the way that matters, in a way that can impact, not the way we think the world should impact, but the way God knows how to impact. And so when we recognize Jesus' lordship and surrender to him, we will be empowered. We will make a difference. But in order to receive that power, we need to make some honest self-assessments. It requires being okay with being vulnerable. See, the reality is that to be cleaned after underscores our vulnerability. When we were babies, we couldn't clean after ourselves. We needed someone to feed us, someone to wipe our behinds, to bathe us. There was very little we could do to refuse this constant washing. All we could do was surrender to it. Then we become preteens, teenagers, and some of us show how much we dislike washing. It's not until we are adults, for some of us, that we understand we really need to clean up after ourselves. And we find ourselves sometimes having to clean up after others who don't realize how dirty they've become. Because walking in this world gets you dirty. Even if you've received Jesus' cleansing and baptism, the fact is that you're going to soil yourself as you go through the world necessitating a wash. Everything here gets dirty. Everything needs to be clean from time to time. Back in Jesus' day, feet got dirty. Cleaning was a part of daily life. To refuse a foot washing was an appalling thing, especially if you're going to enter somebody's home. You don't want to do that with your feet dirty. I mean, you're reclining at a table when you're eating at somebody's home, so your feet are going to be in somebody else's face. <laughs> you know that they don't want to. You don't want to offend your host. You don't want to offend other guests by sticking your dirty feet in their face. So everybody got a foot washing. Everyone accepted it, but hey, you only accepted it from certain people, the cleanup people, the servants who cleaned dirty feet, who washed dirty feet. They were beneath you. They touched other people's feet. They touched your feet. And even though they had to get close to you, they had to touch your feet to wash it. You kind of pretended that they weren't. I mean, that's an intimate thing, touching somebody else's feet. It's kind of like that even today with health professionals. There you are at the dentist's chair drooling with your mouth open like a freshly caught bass, <laughs> all vulnerable. You're at the mercies of this doctor. Yeah, there is some trust involved to let someone get that close to you, right? I mean, they could really hurt you. Sometimes they even do, and you're paying them for it. But the whole point is that you do it because something needs to be fixed. Something needs to be cleaned. Our bodies, they get worn out. They get broken as we live. We get dirty walking around in this world. Yes, and I'm not just talking about physically speaking. I'm talking about the inside, the spirit, the soul. Who can clean that? How do we clean that? Well, I've mentioned baptism, and a Christian becomes clean when he is immersed with Christ, as Romans chapter 6 talked about. We die with Christ. We're buried with him through the watery grave of baptism. We're raised up to walk in newness of life just as Jesus was raised up. That's the first step of becoming a Christian. That's how we are born again. That's how we receive the Spirit. That's that initial cleansing, how we're born from above. But we need to continue clean, uh, continue being cleansed. Jesus speaks about that in 1 John 1, 7. John reveals there that we are in a continuous cleanse as we walk in the light. We walk in the light as Jesus walks in the light, and His blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We need to remain in Him. Remaining in the Word, remaining in Him, is how we're prepared to be blameless, pure, ready for the revealing of Jesus on the last day. Jesus is clean. He is holy. 
so we must be clean inside and out. So in John 13, verses 6 through 10, it reads, He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath only need to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. Jesus gave us the ultimate example here of how we keep each other clean. Yes, foot washing is a one another thing. You're going to need my help keeping yourself clean. You can't do it by yourself. I'm going to need your help too. I think this is the hardest kind of love to give. It never gets easy to do. It gets tiring. But it's absolutely necessary to practice this aspect of love. I believe it is the kind of love that proves to the world that we are his disciples. Even the Bible says that when Jesus washed the feet of the disciples, he showed them the full extent of his love. That's what the text says. Why was the foot washing the full extent of his love? Why and how are we to imitate that? I think it requires self-control. It requires selflessness to practice. You must really love the person more than you love what they think of you. You must be pretty grounded in your confidence in Christ to do that, just as Jesus knew who he was and where he was going when he decided to wrap that towel around his waist. So what can we learn from Jesus' foot washing? Like I said before, we learn that true power empowers others. A truly powerful person doesn't squash other people, doesn't try to get ahead in spite of them. A true powerful person wants to share their power, wants to bring others to their level. And that's what Jesus does. He's showing us what true power does. It serves Isaiah 42, verse 3, describes Jesus' gentleness. It says about him, a bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Empowering is about getting close to one another, close enough to wash each other, close enough to touch each other, to encourage each other. Jesus doesn't bully people. Neither should we be bullying people. Bullies have low self-esteem. That's why they need to compensate and make themselves bigger than they are. Jesus doesn't do that. That's a characteristic of Satan and the spiritual forces of evil. This passage also teaches us that to receive this empowerment, this washing, this cleansing Jesus wants us to, to give us, we need to understand what Peter had to understand that we need to acknowledge that we ourselves are dirty, that we must want to receive this cleansing. And in order to receive this cleansing, we have to acknowledge our vulnerability. That is shown in this passage in 1 Timothy 1.16, where Paul says, For that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. This is a healthy self-view. It's not a tragic view. It's not self-pity. It's not catastrophic. It's not based on self-esteem, but it's based on Christ-esteem. This is what healthy people think. They know that they're sinners. People who acknowledge that Jesus is Lord understand that he is Lord and that he wants to help clean us. He wants to help us so that we could have a relationship with him. And so he displays this immense patience in us, this grace and this mercy, empowering us so that we are also able to love one another and wash one another's feet. But we have to be okay being vulnerable. We have to be okay, as John says in 1 John 1, 9 and 10, we have to be okay confessing our sin. We have to be okay claiming that, yes, 
we're not all that we're cracked up to be, that we've sinned, but that we want to walk in the light. And so we confess our sins, as it says here, because he is faithful and he is just, and he will forgive our sins and purify us. Those of us who claim that we haven't sinned, that we're okay, it says here we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. In 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 10, the passage says, we're hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. This is Paul sharing how he felt. We need to be honest and transparent with our emotion, not pretending to be something that we're not, but being genuine with each other. In verse 10, here in this passage, 2 Corinthians 4, 10, he says, we carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Oftentimes, Paul spoke of how he wished to die, how he felt like he wanted to die. And that is okay. A Christian who's confident in Christ can say those things and can admit that because we know that Jesus has real power and he cleanses us. A healthy view of ourselves, unashamed and transparent, is a must in order to be able to receive the cleansing and the power Jesus wants to give us. If we make ourselves to be something else, if we try to make ourselves bigger, if we hyperbolize ourselves in some way, well, James is pretty clear about that in James 4, 10 to 11. It says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, it says, don't slander one another, anyone who speaks against a brother or a sister or judges them, speak against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. Instead of judging and criticizing each other, which is what happens when you think you're something you're not, we need to humble ourselves before the Lord. Humbling ourselves before God means that we have a healthy self view and we know who our Lord is and we seek justification from Him not from each other. We're not to slander each other. We're not to think that we're better than one another. People who even claim that they're better than the president or better than this politician and find themselves constantly criticizing public servants uh, or politicians are people who don't have a healthy self-view. These are people who are not comfortable with their own vulnerability. They think they can be in control, but they fool themselves because they're not realizing Jesus is the one who rules. He is the one who reigns. And we need to conform to him, not to anybody else, certainly not to our own image. We need to be okay being vulnerable. Before Peter, uh, before Jesus washed Peter's feet, Peter had to let Jesus do it. He had to be honest with himself and, and realizing he needed to be cleansed. And when we humble ourselves in that way, it says here, God will lift us up. So with the right attitude and perspective, we will be ready to walk in the footsteps of Jesus and wash each other's feet. As it says here in John 13, 12 through 14, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord and rightly so for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. You see what Jesus did there? I mean, he. it says here that he finished washing his feet, he put on his clothes, returned to his place. Now this, this, this explanation of how Jesus did is, is a great reminder of even the gospel because you know, Jesus was sitting at his place in the table. You know, everybody knew he was Lord. He was master. He was at the head of the table. And realizing the passage at the very beginning starts off by saying he realized who he was, where he had come from, where he was going. And so he got up from the table. He got out of his place on the table. He changed his outer garment. He put on a towel. Do you, do you see what's going on here? He cast off. His divinity puts on a towel, puts on the nature of a human being and washed their feet. Jesus left heaven, the throne, to become like us, to wash us, to serve us. And then when he was done, it said here, he put on back his clothes. That's a foreshadowing. 
how he's going to put back on divinity and return to his place, his place ruling, his throne ruling. So I just love that foreshadowing there, uh, explaining this place. And then he calls us now to do the same thing he did for us, to wash each other's feet. And to do so, we need to get up close and personal. We probably need to touch and get involved with things that we'd rather not be involved in. Yes, making a right judgment about somebody else's life to give the proper encouragement and the proper guidance. We need to get involved. Sometimes it involves stepping on each other's toes, but we need to be okay with that kind of vulnerability, that it's what's going to enrich our relationships. That's how we will, be, we will be able to spur one another on. And so that's what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 through 15. He says, we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that no one pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Notice, how are we going to warn the idle? How are we going to know who the idle are, who the disruptive are, who the disheartened are, <laughs> who the weak are? Well, we need to be paying attention. We need to be involved in each other's lives and not afraid to judge, to make the right judgment. That is not the other one that James was talking about. See, we, we're not out to be making judgments about because we feel offended or because somebody stepped on our toes. No, when somebody tells you to do the right thing. Don't get mad because they're telling you to do the right thing. Sometimes we might not say it the right way. We might say it in a way that you don't like. But focus on what you're being told. If you're being asked to do something good, if you're being asked to do something right, then focus on that. God is testing you. Don't get offended. Don't judge the wrong way. Judge the right way. Because this is how we wash one another's feet. You have to be okay with somebody getting close enough to you to wash your feet if needed. And besides, you need to be believing that it's Jesus, our head, the head of the church, who's directing somebody to tell you these things. God bless you. Thank you very much for listening. I hope the Lord gave you insight into conforming to Jesus with today's message. I always appreciate feedback. You can send me your thoughts, musings, and comments directly through the Anchor app. You can also contact me on Twitter at Kingdom underscore Saint. Walk with the Lord today and be a blessing.